series called Advance, and she started by giving us some of the details, some of the details about what God wants to tell us, some of the details that we just need to let him handle, and some of the details about the specifics of the fast that we're going to invite you to join us in. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to invite you to ride out with me. And so I wanted to start the, the service off with that video clip from Lord of the Rings. Some of you might have seen those movies. Uh, that's one of my favorite clips from the Lord of the Rings movies. I just think it's so powerful, that statement, ride out with me. And we're going to get more into that as we go. But I wanted to frame up the battle that we're all in. Because sometimes we don't realize it and sometimes we don't recognize it, but we are in a battle. Now, luckily, our battle is not like what that battle was with a physical enemy physically knocking down the door, physically trying to attack and hurt and kill our kids and our whole country. We're not in that kind of battle. It's not a physical battle, but we are in a battle nonetheless. Ephesians describes it this way. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So yes, we're in a battle. It's a different battle. It's not a physical battle, but it is a spiritual battle, but a battle nonetheless. Now, this might sound like a little bit of a strange statement for me to say, but sometimes I wish the battle we were fighting was actually a physical battle. What I mean by that is if we were fighting a physical enemy, we could see the enemy. We could see where they are at, what they're trying to do. If they were trying to break down that door, we could barricade the door. There's actions that we could take physically to stop a physical attack. And not only could we stop the attack, but if there was a wound, we could see the wound right away. We could treat it with first aid and medical attention. We would solve that issue quickly. And I know some of you in this room pretty well. If there was an attack against one of your kids, you're going to stop that attack. I know the mama bears out here, you, know, the mom, you don't get in front of the mama and the cubs because the mom is fierce. So there's some mama bears, there's some papa bears, there's some grandma and grandpa grizzly bears in the room. And guess what? If, if someone's trying to come and get your kid, you're going to do whatever it takes to stop it. So we need to shift our mindset a little bit. It's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. So it requires different tactics than what we might do in a physical battle. When I was in the Marine Corps, I can remember a period of time where I would run three to five miles, spend an hour lifting weights in the gym, and then swim a thousand meters. I would do all three of those things every day, every day, all three in one day, every day. So that was a physical thing. I was trying to prepare myself physically. I was preparing a physical way for a physical battle. This is a spiritual battle. So we need to think about the tactics differently. A few... Uh, a few months ago, we talked about the passage of Scripture where the disciples were trying to heal or drive out a, a demon from a sick boy. And they had previously had success in healing and driving out demons, but in this case, they were not able to do it. And when Jesus came back, he, of course, drove out the demon, but then later they asked him, Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? And he responded to them that this kind only comes out by prayer. And certain manuscripts would inc include and fasting in that statement. So prayer and fasting. But I also want to point out that it says this kind, this kind of evil spirit, this kind of demon only comes out by these tactics. So yes, there are different kinds of enemies. There are different kinds of demons. And some only respond to different things like prayer and like fasting. It's a different kind of kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. And in that kingdom, we fight differently. We look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. It describes Jesus coming back in the end of days with a sword coming out of his mouth. That sword represents his word. The word of God is powerful and it's effective. And so we've got to train our minds to not think physically, but to think spiritually. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is through calling a church-wide prayer and fast for the next few weeks. So let's look at fasting a little bit. Um, I always like to start with Jesus because Jesus is the disciple maker. We're supposed to be like him. So what did he do? Well, we can read in the Gospels that Jesus fasted. He fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. So it was something that he did. He led by example. He did it himself. But he also taught a little bit about fasting. He was teaching his disciples in Matthew. And he says, when you fast, notice it says when, not if you fast. 
So there's something to that statement. He assumed that his disciples were going to fast. And then again in Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, he's being questioned by some of the disciples from John the Baptist. And those guys said, well, we're fasting right now. Why aren't your disciples fasting? And he said, well, they will fast whenever I'm gone from them. So he assumed his disciples would fast. And when was that? When he was gone. So we're still in those conditions right now. He's still gone. So yes, we should fast. And he led by example. He did it first. He showed us what to do. So we're in a battle. Part of that battle was fasting and praying. Jesus led by example. He expected us to do it. So it does. It starts with us. We've got to get ourselves right first. If we're fighting a battle and, you know, I'm not equipped and I'm not ready to fight, then I'm not going to be any help in that battle. So we've got to get ourselves right first. Now, I sit on this platform maybe three months ago, and I said to all of you, I don't like to fast. Do you guys remember that? I don't like to fast. Uh, but I can honestly say God's been working on my heart. And while I may not be excited for fasting, I'm actually looking forward to fasting and for all of us to fast together because more than what I want, more than my desire for food, I desire to see God's hand move in my life. He has more for me. He has more for my family. He has more for this church and this community. And if fasting moves the hand of God, I want that more than I want food. So, yes, I'm, I think I'm ready to jump into this fast. The thing is, when I said that, when I made that statement, I don't like to fast, part of the reason why I said that goes back to what I said previously about what I used to do when I was in the Marine Corps. I would work out. I would exercise. And so I certainly don't exercise to that extent anymore. But I always like to stay somewhat physically fit, right? I want to feel healthy. I want to feel good. I want to look good, all that kind of stuff. So I've always maintained, whether it's running or just working out, whatever it was, a level of fitness. And if you've ever spent any amount of time in the weight room, you know if you're trying to build muscle, trying to put on size, you need to eat. And if you're exercising, you're really stretching those muscles, you need to eat really bad because you're really hungry all the time. And so that's one of the things that caused me not to want to fast because I'm working out. I don't, I don't want to fast. I, I need to keep doing this. And re the reality is that it's a harsh word to speak over myself, and it's a harsh reality. But my unwillingness to fast was because I put working out. I put my body above God. So I was worshiping fitness. I was worshiping myself. I was wor worshiping vanity. All these other things. I put that before God. So I was willing to punish my flesh physically by working out in order to make physical gains, but I was unwilling to punish myself physically by not eating to make spiritual gains. So we've got to get our priorities right. We've got to put God first in every area of our life, and yeah, that includes our willingness to fast. Now, you might be there in, this, in the seats and say, well, I don't even work out, so I don't have to worry about that. But if we're not careful, we can do it with other things. We can do it with entertainment, right? Well, we got the national championship coming up. No, I'm not going to fast because, you know, I like to eat snacks while I watch the game. Uh, well, what about the birthday party? What about Super Bowl? Super Bowl's coming. We've got Valentine's Day, all the chocolates in the house. And so we go from one thing to another and to another, and we say, well, I'm not going to fast because of this. So we put entertainment first. Or what Paul said in Philippians is their God is their stomach. So we got to be careful what we're doing. We got to make sure we're putting God first. So we got to settle that right in our hearts first before we do anything else. And then I want to take a look at what some of the scripture says about our flesh. So our flesh is strong and it's powerful and it's, it's got a grip on us. And if we're trying to grow spiritually and strengthen ourselves spiritually, we need to weaken the flesh. So Romans chapter 7 verse 18, says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want to do. So we've got to conquer our flesh. One of the ways that we do that is by weakening our flesh so that our spirit can be made strong. So flesh is one area that we need to conquer, but there's actually a couple other ones that I want to address. I'm going to read 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 
It says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, we talked about that, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And it happens that all three of those things that we're supposed to overcome actually can be seen in the story of when Jesus fasted himself. We can walk quickly through that story. It says that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and at the end of the fast, he was hungry. And the tempter came, the deceiver, the enemy, the Satan came, and he started to have a conversation with Jesus. He started to test him and tempt him. It says that Satan said, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus had overcome his flesh and mastered his body through discipline and self-control. And his craving was no longer for physical food, the physical things that the flesh wanted, but his craving was for spiritual food, the word of God. So fasting can help us overcome our flesh through self-discipline and through desiring and craving spiritual things more than food. The other thing is the pride of life. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, it says, The devil took him to the holy city and said, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in your hands, in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Satan was trying to play on Jesus' pride. This is what you said, right? This is your word, and he's trying to trick him, trying to get him to do something that he wasn't supposed to do. Nobody likes to be wrong. No one likes to be questioned or made, look to, made to be look like they're incompetent. Pride can be powerful and it needs to be overcome. What Jesus did was to, to combat pride was he humbled, our, humbled himself through fasting. That's what fasting does. It humbles us. It says, I'm weak. I need you, God. I need you to move. I need your strength. I need your wisdom. I need your self-control. If, if the opposite of pride is humility, then we need to humble ourselves through fasting, and that will help us overcome the pride of life. And the last thing is the lust of the eyes. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I think if we're honest, we can say that humans struggle with the, the lust of the eyes. We can see things that we want. We, Satan showed him kingdoms and all their splendor, all the stuff, all the money, all the fame, all the position, all the authority. Something inside of us as humans says, oh, I want that. I'll take that. And Jesus overcame that, not by seeking those things, but by consecrating himself to God, worshiping and serving God only. And so fasting can help us in all three of these areas if we do it right. So if we get these things right first, then we can move forward. And I want to stop for a second and emphasize and point out that in all three of these situations where Jesus was tempted, he quoted scripture. He was teaching us how to fight those battles by using his word. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 describes the sword of the spirit. And it says that's the word of God. Jesus is showing us how to swing a sword, the sword of the spirit, by quoting scripture and that's something that we need to grab onto and hold onto as we head into this fast and prayer period of time. So it starts with us. We've got to get ourselves right first. We've got to get our attitude right. We've got to put God first. We've got to start to overcome our flesh, our pride, desires for other things. And fasting is how we do that. Fasting helps us get there. Next, I want to look at Isaiah chapter 58 for a minute. And this is a passage about fasting. And you can read along on the screen. I'm just going to kind of pull out a few things. But the prophet was telling the people, this, you know, this fast that you're doing, it's not going to work. You're not doing it with the right motives. You're not doing it with the, light, the right lifestyle. It's not aligning with what you say and what you do. They're not, they're not lining up. So I'm going to read a few parts of this. It says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. 
is this the kind of fast that I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? And then it goes on and it talks about, you need to share your food with the hungry. Provide the poor and wanderer with shelter. Do not withhold from those who are oppressed. And so it talks about some of the conditions that need to be met for a fast to be effective. So if it starts with us, we've got to get our heart right first, and we've got to fast with the right motives. What we do in action needs to line up with what we say. So we can't be fasting on one hand and then arguing and quarreling on the other. We can't be oppressing people on, on the other side. Our, our lives need to line up. We have to have the right motives for what we're doing. So I think if we get those things right, then we can move ahead. It's uh, a couple of things I want to just point out before moving to the next slide. I think we need to make sure that we create our own wilderness when we're fasting. Scripture says that Jesus went into the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you. I don't live in the wilderness. Where I live looks a little bit more like a jungle, right? It's a little chaotic. It's a little crazy. Like multiple jobs, kids, wife, house, all the things, right? It, it's, not, it's nothing like a wilderness. But we've got to figure out how we can create a wilderness. What, what does that look like for you? I don't know. Maybe you decide during the next few weeks, you know what, I'm going to fast my lunch hour. And instead of going to the lunchroom or hopping over to Chipotle, I'm going to just sit in my car, I'm going to turn on worship music, and I'm going to pray. Maybe your car is your wilderness. Maybe it's a quiet corner of the basement. Sometimes I do that. Just to get away from things, just to quiet down and just create a wilderness. We've got to do that. That's got to be part of our actions. I think we need to recognize the truth of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, which says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. The fasting may not seem pleasant. I'm not going to lie. It, it, you're going to be hungry. It says it might seem painful, but later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained up by it. Now, that's not fasting. That's discipline. But fasting is a spiritual discipline. So I believe this applies there. I think we need to recognize that after Jesus fasted in Luke chapter 4, it says that he returned in the power of the Spirit. That's what we're after. We're after returning in the power of the Spirit. We may be physically weak, and that's okay. Because we don't need the flesh. We need the Spirit to be powerful. So if you're feeling weak, that's okay. Feed on the word of God. Feed on prayer. That's where our spirits will be made strong. And I think we need to recognize and remember Jesus' words in chapter 14 of John, verse 12. He says that you will do even greater things than these, talking about his miracles. Jesus said we would do greater things than he did. But how can we do greater things than he did if we aren't willing to do the things that he did? Jesus fasted. He fasted before he began his earthly ministry. He fasted before he did miracles, before he spoke powerful sermons, before he walked on water, before he healed the blind. He fasted first. And that's why we're fasting the first part of this year, because we want to make sure that we're consecrating ourselves to God first. We're praying and fasting first. We're, we're gaining spiritual strength first. And then we can face this year in the power of the Spirit. So what do we see when the fast is done right? When we get ourselves right, when we get our motives right? Well, we can turn to the second part of Isaiah 58. And we can start to see some of the things that can be done through God's power when we fast. So I'm going to read through this list. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice. That's the correcting of wrongs. To untie the cords of the yoke. That's to loosen the grip of things holding you back. To set the oppressed free, freedom from worry, overload, burden, persecution. To break every yoke. That's freedom from addiction and bondage. And Beth, if you would just flip to that picture of the yoke. I want to stop here for a second and just talk to this point. If you don't know what a yoke is, that's a yoke. And it's used in agriculture to put two ox together. And wherever one ox goes, the other one goes. They're tied together. They cannot be separated. And what Scripture says is that fasting can help release God's power and move his hand to break that yoke. So some of us have been tied to or know people that have been tied to something that we don't want to be tied to anymore. It could be an addiction. It could be something that's just controlling our thoughts, controlling our lives. There's deliverance in the power of God, and fasting is one of the ways that that 
power is released. So I want to see these yokes broken over our lives and over our loved ones. That's why I want to fast. You can go back to the other slide. So a few more things. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. That's wisdom and understanding. Healing will quickly appear. That's healing. Your righteousness will go before you. I don't know about you, but my righteousness is filthy rags. So my righteousness that goes before me is Jesus. Jesus will go before us. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. That's protection. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. Quick response to prayers and needs. The Lord will guide you always. That's guidance and direction. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Our needs will be met even in hardship. And he will strengthen your frame, physical strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. That's health, abundance, and endurance. You can play the second clip. Let this be the hour when we draw swords together. Fell deeds awake. Now for wrath, now for ruin, and the red dawn. They would have never seen the victory if they didn't ride out. They would have never seen the victory if they didn't ride out. Will you ride out with me? The enemy is at the gate. He's at the door. He's knocking it down. He's coming for your kids, our schools, our country, our families. He's coming for us. Will you ride out with me? It's not our power. It's God's power. But God's hand moves when his people move. I don't know why God chooses to involve people in what he does. I, I don't know why. But think about, like, the Battle of Jericho. God could have just snapped his fingers. Those walls could have fell, and that would have been it. But no, he's like, no, we're going to have a march around a whole bunch of times. We're going to yell. We're going to blast our trumpets, and then the walls will come down. I think fasting is a little bit of the same thing. He, he wants to teach us something as we fast. He wants to teach us something about him. He wants to teach us something about ourselves. He wants us to trust him. So this is a battle. It's a different kind of battle. This battle will be marked with praise, with prayer, with scripture reading, by humbling ourselves. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So what do you say, Mama Bears? What do you say, Papa Bears, Grandma and Grandpa Grizzly Bears? Will you ride out with me? Will you engage in this battle? When we fast, God's hand is going to move. I believe that. We're going to see all these things that are listed in Scripture. We're going to see the bonds broken. We're going to see healing. We're going to see all kinds of things. But we've got to get our heart right first. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. On the stage, I've got four stacks of paper. They're all the same. But for our response, what I want to invite you to do in just a minute, is to draw swords together. By getting up out of your seat and grabbing one of these papers, you're saying, I'm going to ride out. And the word is intensify. I'm not asking you to not eat for 21 days. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking you to pray for 21 days straight. But intensify. What does it look like for you to take the next step? Maybe you've fasted in the past. Maybe it's just been a day. Can you do two days? Maybe you, maybe you pray for 10 minutes every day. Can you pay, pray for 20 minutes? 
What does it look like for you to intensify, to draw close to him? Scripture says when we draw close to him, he'll draw close to us. What does it look like for you to take that next step to say, you know, I'm going to fast one day each week for the next three weeks. That's three days. You can do that. We're going to open up the prayer uh, room on Mondays, but you've also got this prayer schedule Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. We're going to open the church. We're going to invite you to come and pray together as a church. Scripture Emily referenced last week was when Jesus said to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, couldn't you, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. I want to invite you to come out starting tonight. Come and pray as a church. So here's what I want to do. If, if you are all in and you're saying, yeah, I'm going to do something more. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do something. When the, when the song begins to play, I just want you to come and grab one of these sheets. There's a number of things on this sheet that I want you to be praying about. And there are certain responses that I want you to write down of where you want to see God's hand move, where you want to see healing or whatever it is. And I want you to be specific because we believe God will answer these prayers and we want to be able to share testimonies at the end of this of what God did. So the invitation's out there. Will you intensify in this spiritual battle? Will you ride out with me? You can come and grab a sheet. We're going to play this song, and then at the end, I'm going to close us in prayer. So over the, over the next couple of days, I want you just to begin asking God, God, what do you want me to do in this period of prayer and fasting? What do you have for me? And begin to pray over each of these points and write people's names in those points. Write what you want to see God do. And on the back of that, there's some green squares. Those are just some general prayer points that as you're spending time in prayer, you can be praying and lifting up each of those points. So let's pray together as we enter into this season of prayer and fasting as a church. Heavenly Father, God, we know that you are a good, good Father. And God, sometimes we don't understand why you work the way you work, and sometimes we don't understand why fasting and prayer works, but we know in Scripture it does. And God, we want to link our heart with your heart, so help us to get our hearts right first, to put you back where you belong in the number one place above everything else, even food, God. Help us to find the wilderness, to find time to seek you in prayer, to lift up names and to stand in faith. And God, we thank you in advance that we are going to see you move in power and that we're going to be seeing healings and we're going to be seeing things happen that can only be explained because you did it, because God did it. So we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory. Go with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let's do this.